Modus ponens and modus tollens, rules of inference. Modus ponens, if P then Q, P, therefore Q. Above the line are premises, and below the line a conclusion, just like an argument. Those premises entail the conclusion. We can put in simple sentence letters to follow P and Q. Here A goes in for P, B for Q, so we get, if A then B, A, therefore B. But we can use much more complicated sentences as well. Here A and either B or C will follow P, and if B then D will follow Q. This sentence becomes both our antecedent of the conditional and the second premise, while if B then D becomes the consequent of the conditional and the conclusion of the whole argument. Whatever you sub in for P or Q, no matter how long or short, if it follows the same format as modus ponens, you can use this rule to derive the consequent of a conditional. Modus tollens is pretty similar to modus ponens, except instead of getting the antecedent, we negate the consequent. Above the line are premises, below the line the conclusion they entail. We'll sub in A and B to follow P and Q. The important thing to notice is that the negations are preserved. If A then B, not B, therefore not A. We can sub in pretty complicated things for modus tollens. We'll use the same ones. Notice that A and either B or C is still the antecedent of the conditional, but this time the negation of P is our conclusion. If B then D subs in for Q, but this time if B then D is negated in the second sentence, second premise. Note that these negations are outside of parentheses. The whole sentence is negated. We're not dealing with just not A or not B. We're dealing with entire negated sentences. Let's sum up the rule form of modus ponens and modus tollens. First of all, they must both have a line with an arrow or conditional as the main operator. This will never work if you only have not, or, or and. As rules of inference, these apply only to whole lines, and they only apply in one direction. Every time you use these rules, you'll be citing two lines, one conditional, and either the antecedent for modus ponens, or the negated consequent for modus tollens of that conditional. Translations often help us understand what rules mean, and also help us use them in the real world. We'll sub in it is raining for P and the ground is wet for Q. Modus ponens would read, if it is raining, then the ground is wet. It's raining. Well, therefore, the ground is wet. Modus tollens will read, if it is raining, then the ground is wet. The ground is not wet. Therefore, it is not raining. Notice that if then tracks the arrow and not tracks the squiggle. Let's take a look at the truth tables for these. Again, they're pretty similar. Joint truth tables can help us understand any rule of inference and why they work. Because these are little arguments, we can show with truth tables that they are valid arguments. Since they're valid arguments, we know they work every time and never lead to a false conclusion, so long as they have all true premises. So we're going to highlight all the rows with all and only true premises. For modus ponens, that's the first row, with P and if P then Q. For modus tollens, that's the last row, with not Q and if P then Q. In each of these truth tables, the other rows don't matter, because there's at least one false premise. Now we check and see, is there a true conclusion? And it turns out, in both cases there is. You can't have these premises without getting that conclusion. Which means we know these rules work. They've been tested with an infallible truth table method. Let's see how to correctly use modus ponens in a proof. Here's a very simple example. P and Q, first premise. Second premise, if Q then R. Third premise, 
not third premise. Conclusion, R. Well, we'll use simplification as our first rule. We get Q for line 3. We don't need P for anything, so we'll ignore it. And, well, Q is the antecedent of the conditional in line 2, so that's all we need for a modus ponens. We get R from 2 and 3. How about a slightly more complicated one? If P, then, if not Q, then not R. Not Q and P. Therefore, not R. Well, we simplify P, and we simplify not Q. We'll be needing the both. Then we'll do a modus ponens. If not Q, then not R. That's the antecedent of the first conditional, or that's the consequent of the first conditional, rather. P, that we got from line 3, is the antecedent. Finally, we're able to get not R. We've got not Q, the antecedent of the conditional, and we've got the conditional. If not Q, then not R. So we are able to derive the consequent, not R. How about modus tollens? If P, then either Q or R. Well, neither Q nor R. Therefore, not P. This is going to be a very easy one, because the consequent of the conditional in line 1 is already negated in line 2. All we need is modus tollens. All right, how about this? There's quite a few negations in here, and that can be tricky territory. First of all, we'll simplify not Q and not R. You'll find yourself using simplification as the first thing you do pretty often. Now we're able to do a modus ponens and get, if not P, then not Q. Why? Because we have not R right there in line 4. Now we can do our modus tollens with lines 3 and 5. Not Q and gets us not not P. Notice that not Q is the negation of the consequent. That allows us to negate the antecedent. Because not P is already negated, we get not not P. The negation of not P isn't just regular P. We always have to add a negation on when we use modus tollens. We have to follow exactly the format of the rule. Later on, we'll use a rule that will let you get rid of those two not signs. But for now, we'll leave them there. And after all, that's the conclusion. Because these rules are so important and so frequently used, there's quite a few common errors. The first type of common error is to cite only a partial line. We'll see how that works and how to avoid it. The next two common errors, denying the antecedent and affirming the consequent, are common fallacies involved that involve mixing up modus ponens and modus tollens. So here's some kinds of partial line citation. In our first example, if P, then if Q, then R, we cite Q and try and get R from modus ponens. That would be fine, except we're citing the wrong arrow. That's not the main operator. We do something similar for the modus tollens. Not Q gets us not P. Here, the arrow is the main operator, but those parentheses are preventing us from using it. Q isn't the consequent. The consequent is, if not Q, then R. We could try something like this. If P, then R, just skip through Q since we know Q is true, but that's not how modus ponens works. Meanwhile, modus tollens cannot let us use this as the main operator either. We can't use not R and get not Q. So how can we do these? Well, if we have if not P, then if not Q, then R, P, well, that would get us a modus ponens, if Q, then R. Or we could say it's not the case that if Q, then R. That would be a valid modus tollens, not P. Both of these correct uses use either modus ponens or modus tollens on the main operator of the line. That is to say, something that's not in any parentheses. There's other ways to do partial line citation, though. Your main operator might be ampersand. You would be tempted to say, if P then Q, and either P or R, 
P, so Q. That's actually a valid inference, but it skips a step. You need to do simplification first, because the arrow is not the main operator there. You might also be tempted by this modus tollens. If P then R, or P and Q, not R, so not P, or P and Q. But once again, we can't do modus tollens on just a partial line. You'd need some kind of rule to get that conditional all by itself as the main operator. How about denying the antecedent? Remember the antecedent, the first part of the conditional. It's P. Well, modus ponens gives you the antecedent, and modus tollens denies the consequent. But if you deny the antecedent, you run into some trouble. If P, then Q, all right. Not P, so not Q. I've cited that modus polens slash modus tollens because it isn't actually either rule. You might say something like this. If it is raining, then the ground is wet. It's not raining, so the ground isn't wet. But when we translate it that way, it's easy to come up with counterexamples to show that that's not a valid inference. There's a reason this isn't a rule. After all, someone could be watering their plants, they could be washing a car, there could be a chemical spill or a fire being put out. You get the idea. There's a lot of reasons why the ground, why it might not be raining, but the ground might still be wet. So this one is not a valid inference. Another invalid inference is affirming the consequent. If P then Q, Q, so P. Again, it's not clear whether this is a modus ponens or a modus tollens, which should be a clue that it's not going to work. If it is raining, then the ground is wet. Oh, the ground is wet, so it's raining. But someone could be watering plants or, well, these counterexamples are all the same because both of these um, fallacies involve the circumstances where the wet ground and rain don't track. There's a bunch of those circumstances. The case where they work is rain leads to, le to wet ground. Anything else is going to get you into some trouble. When you use modus ponens and modus tollens, be careful to avoid these two common fallacies.